Thank you, Corey. As you just heard, Corey read the story of the fall. The description of good and evil in the garden. This is a bittersweet day for us as Corey and her family, the Dirksons, are moving to Texas in the next couple of weeks. The Dirksons have been such an important part of our church and a true blessing, and we are grateful for them. Corey has led our children's music program. Her children have been involved in the church, both in the children's program and in the youth program. Corey and Clint have been involved in our camping program. It's sad to see them go, but we wish all God's blessing upon them as they begin this new endeavor in Texas. And we are grateful for the service they have provided God here in our church. So as you know, this summer, we're looking at the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible. We're looking at what it tells us about ourselves and about God. Last week, we kicked off our study with the, of creation with the story of Genesis chapter 1, the, the creation story. We saw how the Bible teaches that God created the world, and he created it good. We learned that God created humankind, all of us, in his very image, and that we have a special place in the kingdom of God as his image bearers to do good and to be a witness for God. Now, I think that deep down, we all know that God created this world. At least we know that we are not the creators of this world. We may argue how God created the universe, whether he used evolution or the Big Bang, or whether it happened in seven days or seven years or, or in an instant but we know that there was a creation. Because of that, there is a creator. We, we also know that while God created things good, that it's not always that way in our world. In fact, sometimes we are touched by evil, pain, loss, and brokenness. Even worse, as we have seen lately, Sometimes we as human beings participate in evil and bring harm upon this earth. Evil and its effects on our world are what we're going to be talking about today. Because let's be honest, evil exists. And all of us are touched by it at one time or another. So you know the second story in the Bible, the thing that God teaches us after creation is the reality of evil in our world and how we are to deal with it. And that's what we're looking at today. In the first part of this text that Corey just read in chapter 3, we have the story of Adam and Eve's fall from grace, the story of their sin. And then in this next section, we have the consequences for their actions, or as some like to call it, the curse, the curse of original sin. So listen closely to the remainder of the story, and I think you'll find that amidst the fall, in the middle of evil, there is a story of God's love and grace. In God's creation, whenever evil is evident, whenever there is judgment and condemnation, there is also redemption and hope. So listen to the words of God as they come to us in Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 through 24. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. and With pain you will give birth to children. 
Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam he said, because you have listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. And it will produce thorns and thistles. And you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since you were taken from it, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And Adam named his wife Eve, because she would become the mother of all the living. And the Lord God made skin, garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and clothed them. And the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden a cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. So here's the deal. God creates the world. He creates human beings in his own image. He gave his people freedom, that is the ability to choose. They can choose whether to love and follow God. But simply put, he gave God gave human beings the ability to choose good and evil. He did this by putting a tree in the garden and saying, I have given you this garden for you to play in and to live in and to eat from. You can do whatever you want, eat from any tree, but this one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it's really the tree of choice. Don't choose to eat from that one. Don't touch that one. You have the right to choose. You can do it, but it is a bad idea. I want you to do the right thing here. There's a tree, and I'm telling you, however, don't touch it or you will die. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. That's what God is saying. If you do, you will suffer. So what do the first humans do? Well, they're human beings. And so they do what humans do. They want to test God and see if what he says is really true. Can they get away with a little infraction? Because, because, you know, they're special. They don't cut the tree down. They don't eat all the fruit. They just take one piece. They are testing God. And after all, the tempter says, it's really not that big of a deal. Surely you won't die if you eat the fruit. You're more important than that. Others would die, but not you. People often say, it's not fair that I should be guilty for Adam or Eve's sin. Why is it that it's handed down from generation to generation? I didn't eat the darn apple. But the truth is, and you know it, that had it been you, you would have eaten it. I know I would have, because it's human nature. We are broken. We are inquisitive. If we have a choice, we're going to take it. Deep down, we're selfish. Moreover, I think that as human beings, we just would like to get away with a little something, wouldn't we? When we're told not to do something, the first thing we do is try to think of a way we can do it without getting punished. When we're told to work, we're lazy. When we're told the maximum speed limit is 45 on most major roads, we think, well, that's just a suggestion, right? We can go a little faster. If we just time the lights right, we're not going to get a ticket for that. We think that the rules should apply to everyone else, but not so much to us. It's, it seems to be in our nature. We want to experience our choices and our free will. It, you know, for example, it's, you know that it's not safe to climb to high altitudes. 
Above 10,000 feet, it can be dangerous to people with heart conditions. How many people do you think have said that doesn't apply to me and crossed the 14,000 foot barrier? I bet a number of people in our congregation have climbed a peak of 14,000 feet. Maybe not so bad. I really have no idea how many people have climbed a 14er, but here's what I do know. That over 4,000 people have tried to climb Mount Everest. And only 300 have made, made it. The top of that mountain is 39,035 feet. Only 300 have made it. Over 4,000 try, and they're still trying. Because it seems like maybe the rules shouldn't apply to everybody. You see, as soon as we're told we can't do something, we begin the process of trying to break the rule or the barrier. Now, I know what some of you are saying. Some are saying, yeah, but it's not always bad to break rules. Sometimes breaking rules is a good thing, and that's true. When rules that cause evil are in place, when the rules themselves are examples of sin and brokenness, then they do need to be changed and reformed or redeemed. We celebrate Martin Luther King Jr., who broke social rules and did the right thing to fight for equality. We celebrate him because that was the right thing to do. He stood against evil, not for evil. Today, there are those who break rules in, King's tr in Martin Luther King Jr.'s tradition. And I think that's okay because rules that are designed to make others hurt or less, rules that encourage evil are evil and of themselves. But let's be honest. Sadly, we more often break rules for selfish gain and bragging rights than we do simply because we are fighting evil. We want to have stared death in the face and be able to tell people we defied death and we broke the rules. We think we're better or more deserving than the rest of the world and the rules don't apply. We let sin and selfishness wrap ourselves up in our thinking. We jump motorcycles and bikes and anything on wheels simply to be defiant, to defy gravity. We race cars, we drive drunk, simply because we think the rules don't apply to us and we won't get caught. Did you know that the puffer fish can be deadly if you are stung or you ingest the poison? It's as if God said, this is a pretty fish, don't touch it. If you do, you will be hurt. It's bad for you, very bad. And so you know what humans did? They, somebody said, hey, look at that fish. I bet we could eat that thing. And now across the globe, you can order puffer fish in many gourmet restaurants. In fact, in Japan, every year, over 100 people die eating that fish in restaurants. And even more die catching it and preparing it to be eaten. But yet, we think it won't hurt us. We know this, and still, we want to bend the rules. And the tempter says, go ahead. It'll be fine. It's not that bad. The reality of life is that we're not good in following rules. We're not good at being faithful to God. It's simply trusting that what he says is true. But yet God has created us in such a way that we have free will because if you don't have free will to choose yes or no, right or wrong, you can't be in a relationship with somebody else. And God wants us to freely choose to follow him because that is the heart of being in a relationship. Yet the fact that we have used our sin to betray God, to break the rules, that's the doctrine of sin. There is good and bad in all of us. 
and because the institutions, the organizations we create consist of human beings, there is good and bad in all organizations and institutions. And so when we use the gifts and the guidelines God has given us for anything else than goodness, we are failing. And that is true in our institutions, and it is true in our relationships, and it's true in our personal lives. In fact, you know that the entire Constitution of the United States is built on this idea. The idea that there is good and evil in every human being, and we can choose to be good or we can choose to be evil. The founders knew that, and so they created a government that has checks and balances. We check evil, and we encourage good. If we're going to give power to somebody, the ability to make choices that affect others, we want to make sure that we are checking their ability to choose evil. That they can be overruled by the populace, or the courts, or the power of the veto. It is a good thing. It is a great understanding of the doctrine of original sin. Today, our institutions are being challenged, and we should look closely at where evil in human beings has crept in. We should look closely at one another and find where we have corrupted ourselves. And when we find those things, they should be redeemed. Because in this text, it doesn't simply end with us being condemned for misusing our free will. If you look closely at our text, what you will find in the curse is actually a blessing. The Word of God says, when God speaks in this text, I will put enmity between you and the women speaking to the snake, and between you and your offspring. I'm sorry. Let me read that again. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Here's the promise. Evil will still exist, but from Eve will come one, a human being, who will crush the head of evil. This is the first prophecy of Jesus Christ in the Bible. And it is in the very beginning. As soon as there is a fall, there is a prophecy that hope will come. And we continue to have a choice. The choice now is whether we will follow the fulfillment of that prophecy. Will we follow Jesus Christ, who has the ability to crush evil? All it takes is a simple yes or a simple no. In the face of evil, will you choose yes to be part of it or will you choose no? When you're challenged with issues of integrity, will you choose yes or will you choose no? When you look at another human being, will you see the image of God or will you see something else? Good and evil still exist, but you now have a role to play. You are a moral character. The promise is that God is with us and God has the power through his son, Jesus Christ, to crush evil, and we have become part of his mission. So what will you choose? Will you choose to be faithful? Will you choose to be a follower? Because when evil is present and temptation is all around us, there is always an, inter an alternative. There is the alternative to choose good, to reform evil, to live faithfully. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time for us to choose the alternative. Let us pray. God, thank you for loving us and not abandoning us when we have chosen evil. Help us as your people to be aware of where we are broken and to make choices that further your goodness. Thank you, God, for the opportunity to bear your image to the world. Help us now be faithful. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.